Hello, this is Corey Angelot. Welcome to the End of Slavery Summit. I'm here with a very special guest, somebody who I've known for a while. His name is Will Keller. He's a freedom activist, animist, uh, anarchist, public speaker, and a father. He is the co-host of Natural Freedom League video series and a content creator for the One Great Work Network. He is devoted and morally obligated to increase awareness on the ca causal factors of suffering for humanity and to expand the understanding of the current human condition by educating the public on crucial topics such as conscious parenting, human psychology, human behavior, objective morality, natural rights, and natural law, the universal laws of nature. He states that all of these topics are inseparable for understanding and achieving true freedom for humanity. So this is a very great time to be talking about this because there's a lot going on in the world and we need to relate these to these topics that have been long talked about for thousands of years. And, and we've had strong families, we've had strong tribes, we've had civilizations built upon that. And now we live in a time where there's a lot of people who may not have parents or may not have the social structure or the social, the social structures all over the place. Cause you got social media and all these things influencing people. So if you can help navigate us through this mess, uh, Will Keller, what do you see going on with the current world and why is it important to talk about ending generational slaver slavery, starting with conscious parenting? Excellent. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Um, to me, conscious parenting is one of the, categories that can completely change our current human condition which obviously the current human condition is one of slavery um and this is something that we are born in and we have been born into this it's been different gradients for for hundreds and thousands of years but the current human condition of slavery is mental slavery through ideology and this gets passed down through generation to generation. Um, and so it's important for parents to first have a correct diagnosis of what's going on in the world and then apply that to themselves and and influence their children. Uh, we're constantly playing catch up, right? If the children that are being born today and grow up um, are being passed down these ideologies that promote and condone immoral actions and then they do the same to their children so the social engineers the people that are influencing society on all levels uh, they obviously know this and they use a formula of distract the older generation and program and condition the younger generation to build the new control system the future control system so we're constantly playing catch up um, as as a species on this planet until uh, we can recognize the problem and apply that to the family dynamic. Um, the social engineers know that the only way they're going to influence the youth is if they put a wedge in between the family dynamic. And it's not really them doing it. It's they are influencing through conditioning through beliefs and ideologies and mainly culture and the parents actually do that themselves. Hmm. So it's such a, a, a deep topic. Um, and yeah, I mean, we can, where do you want to take it? Yeah. So I'm curious, why do you mention culture as being uh, the most influential here to changing people's minds and sure. sort of changing the world? Oh, yeah. No, great, great question. I mean, culture is the strong arm of tyranny because culture has to do how we interact with everyone, how we interact with civilization. Even looking at the word culture, it means to cultivate. So what are we cultivating? To me, culture could be negative or positive. We need to observe the world and the actions of individuals, which lead to the aggregate of people. What are those actions? Do they cause harm? Do they condone uh, uh, violence and, and harmful actions and slavery? And in today's condition, they absolutely do. Now, you have cult in the word culture. So what is a cult? A cult is certain ideologies or beliefs that one holds. And if other people don't um, submit to those beliefs or ideologies, then they will be attacked. This is a classic hallmark of what a cult is. Now, if we look at culture nowadays, you can divide it up into 
you know, various categories. You have entertainment um, and uh, social interactions. Nowadays, it's social media. You have schooling and the interaction between students and, and peers. And, um, and there's, there's so many different hobbies and sports and all this kind of stuff. This is all part of culture. But ultimately, it's the interactions that we have um, human to human, right? So this is where the social en engineers know this is how they can gain uh, the hearts and minds of the youth. So they infiltrate the entertainment industries. They control what music is popular, what movies are popular, um, social media apps and all this stuff. And they can do this. And, and another big category, which we'll dive deeper into, is schooling itself, the education platform um that you know that uh, most people are using nowadays so this is there to instill belief systems it's there to shape one's worldview how they perceive the world and how they think it operates that's the main goal and if parents aren't communicating this to their children on how reality operates um, then they are pretty much sacrificing their children to culture itself. And culture is going to mold uh, the minds of the youth. And that's what we have nowadays. Hmm. So it's kind of like an assembly line, right? So, and um, we see this, it's common. Older generations, oh, I just, they just can't relate to the younger generations. <laughs> that may be true on some level, right from just the times are changing technology is advancing but what i'm talking about more is about principles moral principles um they are objective in nature um they are truthful meaning they do not change these are principles that are eternal and these are this is the type of category that can be passed down generation to generation to generation because it's timeless and it will remain true. And it's some of the most important information. What's more basic than we exist, we have a body, we are responsible for this body, and what are the actions that we are taking? Does it cause harm or not? I mean, this is, this is very uh, foundational in this reality. Yeah. So it sounds to me like you're saying, you know, parents got to be careful. They got to be conscious, as you're saying, conscious parenting uh, with what they're doing to their children and what future they're creating for their children. Right. Yeah. But are they wholly responsible for their child for their children? Do the children rely on the parents? I mean, because there can be some conflicts there, too. Right. Sure. Where the parent may be saying over meaning and trying to watch everything they do on social media, trying to make sure everything they do is safe, constantly safeguarding them. Is that a good strategy to use necessarily? Um, I, I, I totally agree with you. You can, you can shelter your children too much and, and I'm not, I'm not for sheltering. Um, we are here to learn lessons. Th this is the whole point of, of existing, right? We, we learn lessons. We learn how to evolve in consciousness and to use this vehicle to gain experience. So, I tell parents and a lot in my work that failure is good because this shows what not to do. So um, if we break it up into a few categories from ages zero to seven or eight, this is the formative years, the formatting years where the child is a sponge and it's just ob um, observing and taking in whatever it comes comes to it and actually embeds and sets the foundation for the subconscious. So this is the most important years of a human's life because this is going to set the, the parameters or the operating system by which um, the, the child is going to grow up and to, and, and to operate in, right? Their belief systems and, and what they come to know and how they think. Um, and then from there, you have, you know, preteen and teenage years where this is the beginning stages of adulthood and there's less sheltering. I take the stance um, and I do this. I have a nine year old daughter. Right. So she's starting to enter into that realm. Um, I live by I will never lie to you and you can ask me anything. So I don't shelter anything from her. I let her um, experience a lot. 
and also communicate with her about what's going on a in the world and within herself and around around in her own environment um we need to figure out some of this stuff depending what we're talking about right we need to figure it out on our own with guidance i see parenting as more of a stewardship or we are facilitators we are facilitating a a young being uh, their experience until they are self-sufficient hmm. in a way, right? Now, of course, looking at culture, there are some things that um, that are pretty brutal that you would want to uh, regulate as much as possible with communication. Uh, my daughter does not have a phone. I don't let her spend time on the phone at large amounts of time. Um, but yeah, we might we might look a video up and do some research and that kind of stuff when she's curious. So it's really understanding that, um, especially a young child, they have needs. And as parents, facilitators and stewards, we need to uh, do our best to fulfill or to provide resources for those needs. It's more of a mentorship than a leadership. I look at leaders as um, a leader will lead you down their own path. Right. So a mentorship is um, one of guidance. It's a stepping stone in consciousness. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a certain subject that you want to gain knowledge on and understanding, you would look to a mentor that specializes in that field. You would gain knowledge and then move on to the next mentor. So I'm, I'm very um, uh, heavy on mentorship. I think we will have mentors and we should have mentors all through life. Right. So, yeah. so would you say that the parents themselves also have mentors because you're saying that there's principles that they should utilize and share essentially with their children. So they're actually being guided at the same time and they're share, sort of sharing that guide with their children. Is that yeah, make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. I consider my daughter a mentor and, and I'll dive into this. This is something hard for parents to understand. In today's culture, right, parents look at their children a as their property and be as um, ignorant to life. And even though there could be, there is some lack of knowledge, but this doesn't stay that way. Children have vast amounts of knowledge to share with their parents, mainly about ourselves. Children's are mirrors. We can look at our own children and we can see qualities and characteristics and attributes that they have picked up from us. And we can learn a great deal about our own selves and our psychology and our emotional st stability just by observing our children because they are just they act just like a mirror, right? They're going to reflect onto us what we've been reflecting onto them. Hmm. So, so the principles are important for the parents to to look at and sort of what I hear from that is walking the talk, right? So. The parent needs to be a living example of of those principles to show like this is what it looks like in action and not that the child has to necessarily completely mimic what the parent does right because they still should have a mind of their own or develop that over time but they they find that right within themselves over time so it, it, it seems like to me it's a process and you do have to be there consciously learning and i agree with you there's there's plenty we can probably learn from children i mean they have a creative mind right they ask yes. questions about everything. They're curious. They want to like fly. They want to go on top of the trees, touch everything. I mean, you know, they they want to do those things. And to me, I think those are expressions of freedom, are they not? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, 100%. You know, there's a uh, there's a study that one can look up and, and maybe we can find it and put it on the screen. It was done in 1992 uh, by two people um, and it, the names are escaping me, but you can look up 1992 study, creative geniuses was like the title of the study and what they found they tested about 3000 children from ages 7 down to 1 right and what they found was 98% of those children were creative geniuses but once they got to grade school it dropped down to 36% once they got to high school it dropped down to 12% and then they tested adults and that dropped down to below 2%. Wow. So freedom is creativity. 
right? Also choice and, and understanding principles, moral principles and how to act in the world. But creativity is, is huge when it comes to freedom. It's, it's pure potential as long as harm is not in, included in that. Children come into this world um, very freedom-minded um, and they don't have the programming and conditioning like adults do. So they learn very easily. And this is why they're easily molded and shaped as well. Mm -hmm. um, kids have huge imaginations. This is another thing I think adults and parents can learn from their children is to get on their level and enter their world, their creative world, and, and share that with them and, and promote that. The imagination is key, especially nowadays where culture wants to control, limit, and dimish the imagination because you have to see it before you can achieve it. So if you can't imagine freedom, then if you can't imagine yourself being better, then how are you going to seek self-development? How are you going to seek what is right and what is and and to be more free and to create freedom in society and within yourself? What I see that what may come to mind with a lot of parents is they think, man, well, I'm busy. I'm, I'm always working. And so I can't Number one, spend time with my kids as much as I want to. And number two, I can't be as creative <laughs> as, I, as I want to or as yeah. I can. I mean, so it, that could be a conflict, too. How, how do parents navigate that? Yes. Big question. I love it. Um, and I'll say one thing. A, a lot of parents that I've talked to and, I, and I, I talk to as many parents as I can from all different spectrums. A lot of parents want to seek answers, which are good, but what they end up doing is they they're seeking parenting styles so they can mimic right it, whether whether it's on one extreme or the other whether it's dana martin full peaceful parenting radical unschooling um or traditional uh parenting do as i say and spankings and all right so i mean there's there's a huge spectrum and this is ultimately a a personal process that each family is going to develop on their own there's certain principles that that I think that are extremely important. One category is sacrifice. Having a correct diagnosis of what is going on in the world and how it's operating is crucial. Like you said, we need to be the change for our children, for ourselves and for our children. So we need to walk the walk. Sacrifice is huge. I'm in a co-parenting situation. Co-parenting situation is the norm, right? There's, I mean, uh, divorce is, is plummeting. Um, uh, children growing up in separate houses is extremely popular. It's the majority, actually. So this is a, a, a deep topic for a lot of people. Where do they get the time? Both parents work and all this stuff. This is where sacrifice comes into play. Um, communicating with the other parent is vital. And that can be tricky. That can be hard and, and sometimes brutal, right? But if you can agree on principles it, themselves, moral principles, um, respect and how you're going to communicate with the child, teenager, um, this is the middle ground. So parents need to understand that, yes, sacrifice is required. Sacrifice happens all the time. This is something that is natural for human beings because we are sacrificing time right now to do this, to do this video. Everyone sacrifices something. We need to analyze that and look at that within our own lives. The majority of parents sacrifice their children when it comes to um, education. They put them in public school. So they let the state and they let culture mold their minds and implement what is moral if they don't teach morality in public school, but they still tell you that, you know, government is is right and our our human rights come from government. Do as you're you're told. So they're ultimately, you know, propagating obedience and submission to authority. Um, so that's one form of sacrifice, one of the biggest. Right. Because as we know, the mental realm is vital. This is the causal factor. So when it comes to subjects like homeschooling or unschooling, uh, I'm a huge proponent of that. Now, that can, that can vary for a lot of people. Um, 
my daughter's mother and I, we homeschooled all the way up to eight. And I say we still unschool, unschool, homeschool. My daughter now goes to a charter school. It's a homeschool charter school, meaning that she can be with us or there's a facility she can go and interact with children. It's a Waldorf inspired. It's based on donations. It's great. It's got a lot of things that the state doesn't touch and doesn't mess with. Uh, that's the middle ground. That wouldn't be my ideal choice, but see, I'm co-parenting. We have to strike a middle ground. Uh, my daughter's mother is very aware of what's going on in the world, but yet she is a teacher and she wants to work and help out in a community-based facility. So my daughter goes there for a few weeks and then she's with me for a few weeks out of school. So there's a middle ground. There's compromise that we've kind of reached. This is going to be different for every parent, right? right? For every family. So seeking someone with the answers is again, looking for leadership, someone to lead down their path that might not work for, for one family. So yeah, there's a lot of discovery on your own, like you're saying. Yeah. Uh, for sure. I mean, I, I went through the public school system and I actually went to cyber school uh, half of my school time, too. I mean, so and I kind of got a taste of both worlds in the cyber school. It was new at the time when I was entering. Um, yeah. It's way different now because now it's becoming more popular. But um, what I, something I would do with my own parents was constantly relay to them the information that I was being taught or the things that I was you know, the things that, that were said to me, the other kids that were influencing me. And by talking to my parents about just what happens at school, I was building not only a relationship with them, but they were able to help guide me. And it would it was able to help me feel better. You know, it was, it was just having them there after that school system was just beneficial within itself, too. So I think just the, the, the parent being there is also really important, right? Because that allows them to express their consciousness with the child and the child can express their consciousness with the parent, which is, you know, they're supposed to be together in nature, right? Mm -hmm. Are they not? They're supposed to stay together as much as possible. And it seems like, oh, well, we just put them in this institution. They'll take care of it. No, it's like you got to it's your child. I think, you know, I'd hope it's really important for people. So how yeah. does this relate to generational slavery? Right. Because we talked about culture and how that influences people. Why is conscious parenting important for generational slavery? I know you kind of mentioned this before, but what is generational slavery? Like in, in particular, is it the culture? But you said it's certain people who are taking it over. So why is that happening? Yeah, no, great question. And um, real quick, I'm going to backtrack to what you just sure. said earlier, because I think this it's a very important to uh, the relationship you have with your parents. That is excellent. And this is something that parents need to understand. It's about the relationship you have with your child, learning in general, right? We learn when we are internally motivated. This is going to be different for every unique human, right? Some children love to learn in group settings. So maybe finding a uh, private school or charter school or group homeschooling, that might be ideal for them. So like you were saying that being being receptive and being there for your child's needs is vital. Getting to know your child. Your child's going to be different from you, but yet still inherit some qualities. So inheriting the qualities, this gets into generational slavery. Generational slavery, as I said in the beginning, these are ideologies and um, even physical attributes that we pass down to our children. I'm going to use a, a very funny analogy. Santa Claus. The majority of parents propagate the notion of Santa Claus, right? This, this fat man that's always watching you and keeping a checklist on your behavior through the year. And he's checking if you're naughty or nice, right? This is mind control. To be blunt, this is using an, an ideology or a belief system for mind control to keep your children, um, A, in a state of fear and, uh, and obedience, right? And it might be funny for a lot of parents, but, but this, this is the analogy. Now, as the child gets older, either figures out on their own or someone tells them, or maybe even the parents confess and say, hey, guess what? Little Timmy, Santa Claus isn't real, right? 
and the kid's like, oh man, that, whatever, and goes about their, their life. But as they get older, what do they do? They do the same thing to their children. They propagate the ideology, the mind control, the lie. Now, this is a very small scale, but this is exactly what's going on um, for hundreds of years when it comes to the belief in authority that if you want to be educated, you have to go to go um, government schooling, public schooling, and you have to go to college if you want to be educated. Your natural rights come from the government. Do what the government says. Obey, right? All of this. These are false uh, false axioms, right? These are um, statements that are considered to be true, but are actually false in the natural world, in reality. So these are ideologies. And we pass these down to our children, just like Santa Claus. So this is what is keeping human beings in the state of slavery, is that they hold these false belief systems. And we pass these down to our children. The notion of genetic modification or vaccines this is something that's being passed down through generations as well. I've talked to so many parents that they've never questioned the fact that their kid has some kind of ailment, whether it's an autoimmune um, disorder or it's a autism, never question the fact that it could have been from something they put in their child's body, right? Because the doctors don't say anything. The doctors just say, oh, it's just, you know, we're we're slaves to our genes. It's something that happens. It's random, right? So this is another thing. This is uh, this is eugenics. So this is the physical aspect of what we pass down to our children. Now, well, I got my vaccine, so I'm going to give my kid all their vaccines. We mm. pass these ideologies down. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a degradation of consciousness. The awareness level is not increasing, and it's not it's, we're not learning as we evolve because we're not evolving. We're devolving. And it's based upon what we hold in our mind, the, the, the knowledge and the information, and then how we apply it. And we are, we're holding these in and then we're passing them down to our children. So as we look at the world and we see that, although currently I think there is a great awareness, right? But there's not a great awakening. We are not moving advancing towards freedom, right? The, the control system is getting stronger and stronger. So what we need to do is just like a narcissist, you don't keep feeding a narcissist and giving it, giving a narcissist attention. You need to detach and move away from the narcissist. This is how government and government institutions operate. So this is why uh, homeschooling or unschooling is important. Educating yourself on uh, diet and how the body works and understanding uh, medicine. And so we can, so we can evolve and we can give our children a great gift. We can be their freedom advocate and we can give them the gift of knowledge and they can take the torch and they can pass it down to their children. We are creating a process of evolution, right? The social engineers know that well, A, they plan hundreds of years of, of, in advance, right? They're not planning 10 years, 50 years. They're planning 100 years in advance. They have a goal where they want society to be. And this, the only way they're going to get there is if they condition and program the next generations. So, hmm. Yeah, so people giving their consent one way or another to exactly. the system because they're unconscious or they willingly consent and say, well, yeah, I mean, it's, I need it. It's good for the common good. It's for the, the greater good, you know, justification, right? To make a exactly. right. Uh, not that it's actually right. So very interesting you mentioned this um, because I had a lot of ideas come to mind. And, and, and really, I think it's important because what we're talking about conscious parenting, the word conscious, I think is really important, right? We, we understand how consciousness works and, and how it's used within our life. But some people might just call it awareness. OK, so let's like let's look at the scenario that you brought up, right, where vaccination. Well, how come the parents didn't question in the very beginning, say, well, what is this? Why is it going to my my kid's body? Why do they need it? But they never asked those questions. So, of course, later on, they're going to be like, oh, well. It's, it's this thing. Oh, I, I didn't know it could have been this thing. They shouldn't have to say that. They should already know, like, yeah, I, I chose this for this reason, for that reason, or, oh, but they didn't make the conscious decision in the first place. So it's like 
same thing when we go to the supermarket and buy something. Do we know where our money is going? Do we know what we're supporting? You know, what brand, what what terms of service we're signing on to when we use a product, right? <laughs> These yeah. things, it's like if we just unconsciously do it because everyone else is doing it or because we're told to do it, it doesn't mean it's it's right to do. I mean, and we're not really questioning morality, like you said. We're not questioning the principles. We're not applying our principles. So, so ending generational slavery with conscious parenting is is integrating a lot of these ideas that you mentioned, right? Principles, having the right schooling through learning, not just um, having the child learn, but you learn through your child. And I, I really like a lot of these these topics that you're mentioning. So I appreciate that. Yeah, and and one thing that that parents need to understand, like we mentioned earlier. It, it starts with the parent, with the individual, right? This work of educating, um, it, it has to be done within themselves first, <clears throat> excuse me, because the reason why no one's questioning, why people are unconscious to a lot of these topics is because A, this is a part of uh, generational slavery, right? These are ideologies that are embedded in the subconscious, meaning that it's just a, it's a part of their habit. Right. This is deep down into the shadow aspect. This is the unconscious realm. The only way that you're going to heal this and shed light to the darkness of the unconscious is through knowledge and education, looking at oneself, having the respect to look again. Right. So this it starts with the parent to ask themselves, what do I believe and why do I believe it? Mm -hmm. Right. On all aspects, health morality, government, what's going on in the world, all this kind of stuff and shining the light on that to, to bring the unconscious to the conscious level. Right. And, and yeah. it would help if those parents also had parents of their own that did the same thing with them. And you kind of made it easier for yourself longer with time, but that's not to say that you can't change things now, right? If you're a parent and sure. let's say you had parents that did not teach you any of this stuff and did not go as much about consciousness as we're talking about right now. Um, you can still take the change, right, and and navigate through it. Where do they start, though? You know, what what where do they start with their consciousness and and to say, well, this is what how I should start with my children. This is the first topic I, I introduce to them. This is how I get them to escape this government belief system. How do they how do they navigate that in today's world? Would you would you recommend any particular resource or a particular way of starting that? Absolutely, and. For and one thing too, once we're a parent, we're always a parent. So you know, I, I get it a lot. People are asking me suggestions for um, older, well, now adults, right? They're children, but they're adults. You all, you're always a parent, meaning you always have influence on your children, no matter what the age, right? So um, we are not responsible for the trauma. And the conditioning that we experienced when we were young children, but we are responsible for our healing and our our growth and development as adults. That is very important for young children. The two topics that I always tell parents to just to just start on, right, and um, is the trivium method, which is directed for for younger children. Right. And that that goes all the way up till uh, to teenage years. And then you transition into the quadrivium. But the trivium is the three way path of truth discovery. So this is grammar, logic and rhetoric. Um, and there's uh, there's some good websites. We'll we'll, we'll mention the the um, the websites. We'll put them in the description. But understanding the trivium and what it is, gathering information, processing it thinking about the inconsistencies and then outputting it into your rhetoric, which is your behavior. This can be applied for young children. If they want to know about oak trees, right? Well, let's go gather the information. Let's go out in the natural world. Let's try to identify an oak tree. Let's, let's make sure this is the oak tree. Bam, there's the oak tree. Let's build a swing, right? So we can promote these things, but the trivium is important because it teaches you how to think not what to think. Public schooling is all about outcome-based education. This is what it was designed to do, to just output good, obedient workers. They're going to teach you, um, speak into you, which is what indoctrination is, what to think, and then 
put you out into the world and, you know, put you on the conveyor belt. So understanding the trivium method, which is how to think, and also understanding nature and the principles by which nature operates, natural law principles, um, the metaphysical and the physical. Um, a good a good place that I like to start is a garden. A garden is just like the mind and body as well, right? We plant, we sow seeds, we reap what we sow. You can actually play with and interact with the natural forces in the garden by the seasons, cause and effect, um, the elements, right? Soil, water, um, care, sunlight, all of these. These are all very simple principles. Kids love to play in the dirt anyways and play with bugs and, and, and plant and stuff. So first understanding what are the natural law principles, right? And, uh, and the trivium method. These two, you can, these are the two categories that parents should focus on and promote all the way up well into the teenage years. Through these two principles, the child is going to fall in love with learning. This is the goal. We want, we want our kids to fall in love with learning and then send them on their way. If they know how to think and they know how reality operates and how to act in the world, what more would you want? They're going to learn and, and figure out what they want to do instead of the parents imposing and, um, and having psychological transference, their psychological and emotional baggage that they put on the children, hoping, oh, my kid is like this or grows up to be a doctor or grows up to be a lawyer or, or whatever, right? We, we, do, we put this kind of stress and pressure on our children. So, um, yeah, that's a Beautiful. good place to start. Hey, yeah, honestly, <laughs> I know it's a lot, but yeah. no, it, it's beautiful. I mean, I even interviewed a, a former school teacher. She was like over 40 years in her profession, right? She teaches all sorts of different subjects. Um, and she's telling everybody just like, get your kids out of the school system now. Just no, no matter what you do, just get them out of the school system because there's so many other options in her view. She's done so much research on this that she's like, hey, you know, you can you can hire a private teacher. They can take certain hours and then you can take certain hours and you can configure so much. And now there's like you know, co-ops and people doing, uh, you know, get togethers where, yeah, um, like you said, maybe they have, there's a community garden. They're all growing this garden together. It could be not just yourself. You don't have to be the only person working this garden. You have other you know people working on it. Uh, maybe the churches want to get involved. Maybe that's not always the best idea, but, you know, maybe mm -hmm. the churches can help with getting the community together. And then from there, you know, you still have your child. Your child has a mind of their own. doesn't matter, right? Like I can go to a political party, right? You can go to a political party organization. And you and I, we both know that there's universal timeless principles we call natural law, right? So no matter what is said there, we have a filter through our brain that we take in that information and we can still discern. As uh, Tobias Lahr says, learn to discern. We're able to yeah. look through the information and say, well, does this validate? Can we let's apply our trivia method? Does this make sense? Right. And so that is a process. I think once you build that in your child, like you're saying, well, then it doesn't really matter. Whatever comes to them in this life, whether it's it's fear, distress, the government is imposing different conditions right? These bunches of people, well, they can be able to navigate through that easier because they were built with this guidance that they got from an early age. So I think it's beautiful that you're sharing that with us, uh, Will, and, and that you're, you make that more of a focus because I think it's um, something that is really, really important for our generation. And so, you know, that's every generation though. You say generational slavery. I mean, that really solves every generation, right? Which is yeah. freeing your own mind, and how do you free your own mind? Well, you need a little bit of guidance to get there, right? So it's interesting Absolutely. because, you know, freedom is this thing where it's like you don't have anybody helping you or directing you or telling you. No, freedom still requires guidance, we're saying, right? Or there needs to be some sort of self-control that creates that freedom. So kind of talk to us about that in regards to, let's say, multiple parents or multiple people, right, together in this world, such as the world we have now. We have a system that we call government in, in, in our existence, and it's telling people what to do with their lives. And there's many people who are willingly going along with it. And you and I, you know, we look at this and we look at this in the, in the lens of universal spiritual principles. And as you mentioned, it's all just opinion and ideology. How do we get that to people in an action way 
we're all adults. We don't, we all, you know, we're, it's, I'm not say, saying, hey, Will, you're my child, or you're not saying I'm your child, although I, I'd love to learn from you. And I think we could all learn from each other. Like you said, there's never a, not a time to learn. Mm -hmm. So what could we do, though, as adults? Do we need to organize? Do we need to teach our, each other still? Is there things that we as adults need to do action wise to change the world and get rid of these systems that don't belong? Great question. And uh, I, I will say too, parents should seek out um, community. I, I do. There's, uh, there's many resources out there. There's many groups, most likely in, in your, your general area, especially, you know, since the, the, the pandemic kicked off, a lot of people pulled their kids out of school. They're getting together. There's groups on telegram and all this stuff. So seek that out. Parents definitely seek that out. Um, yes. Um, Parents, adults, we do need to to get activated, right? Um, and my stance on this is very, it's tapping into my my inner child and we need to create art. I'm a firm believer of this. The question is, how do we reach the unconscious minds? To reach the unconscious, no one can do that for another person. Only the individual can. Only the indiv individual can shine awareness in the inner darkest parts of them, right? Those, the false belief systems, what we we're talking about with generational slavery. We do this through the heart, meaning that we inspire people. So we create art and art has unlimited art forms. Right. We are doing art right now. And then when you put this out, it'll become an artifact. People can watch it and then they can absorb some of the energy that you, that you and I are, are, you know, we're radiating here and they could feel that even though it's on a video. But still, they can feel that that's a form of art. There's dance, there's writing, um, public speaking, all this kind of stuff. These are art forms. Right. This is this is action um, expressed right? Physical action expressed. And that is art. So um, I think people, once they, they do the inner work, right, um, of self-development and gaining an accurate uh, uh, perception of what's going on, absolutely. And, and, and they, should, they should be that mentor for their child about speaking out on injustices and, and creating art forms with the message of truth and freedom and, and morality and put that out to the community. I mean, th this is, has great positive effects on a child when a child sees their parent involved in community. Because no matter what anyone says, we need to be involved in community, local and then on a large scale as well. That it always starts with the inner, within the self, and then that expands out. So get involved with your local community. If you can't find a group, start a group. Start a, a homeschooling group or, or a get-together where kids can, can interact with each other and parents can interact with each other. Um, so, you know, unity is in community. So we need this. It's extremely important. And um, my, the phrase that I use is, uh, no leaders, more artists. And, um, and this is a process of self-discovery. Each person needs to discover within themselves through their own talents and attributes and, and then express that into the world with the message of freedom. Okay. So with independent media, um, a lot of people are producing a lot of content, right? They may be expressing a lot of these art forms. Do you think that they're heading in the right direction when it comes to this message of you know, trying to free the world from this generational slavery? Do you think them just bringing light to these ideas, maybe talking about news stories or um, talking about the left versus right? Do you think all of it is productive essentially toward because they're just spreading ideas and, and people can discern for themselves, but they may not know how to discern. So how is, is independent media really assisting our efforts for freedom? Do you think, do you have any suggestions for independent media or the people who are producing content? Yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> I do think that uh, a lot of the alternative media, independent media, they they actually operate just like the mainstream media, meaning that they focus on the effects of the world. Now, the effects of the world, right? All these dialectics, the current events that come, and it you know seems like they're speeding up and they're changing uh, uh, at a at a steadfast uh, pace. Um, these are just the effects. This is not where the change lies, 
right? And a lot of the independent um, media, they constantly focus on these effects. When I look at um, someone's work, I want to understand if they are at, if they their message, their core message is about freedom and how do we achieve it through morality and right action. This is a huge part. So shining light on some of the effects can be good because you can see the effects and, and recognize that there are problems, right? That kind of sparks an awareness. But how do you create change? This is through the causal factors of understanding what slavery is, what freedom is, how do we get to slavery, and how do we get to freedom, right? The, the why, the why question, the most important. And I don't see a lot of the ind independent media, alternative media, focusing on that, um, which I think they could, they definitely should do. You can report on the effects, but also provide uh, the solution. And again, this is through lack of knowledge. So um, becoming a, a educator, an artist with this message, this is another reason why we need more people doing this kind of uh, content to reach even the, in, um, the independent media and let them know like, hey, you got to ask the big questions of reality and how do we create freedom? Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's my stance on that. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. No, and I think yeah. like just talking about the what we've been talking about with conscious parenting, I would love mm -hmm. to see that being talked about. Like, hey, you know, here are resources for you parents out there who have children, and hey, this is how you can connect with each other. I mean, just that alone could make a pretty big impact, I would say. And, and there's a oh, lot yeah. of people who are raising children, and there's a lot of people who also say, Man, I shouldn't raise any children in today's world. You know, man, it's such a bad world. I don't want to raise any children. <laughs> what do you have to say about that? Oh man, yes, I'm I'm glad I'm glad you said that, man, because <laughs> Yeah, I, I hear that a lot. People are like, oh, I would never, I never want to, would never want to raise a children in this day and age. At one point I was like, okay, I understand that, that mentality, but now I'm, comp I'm on the opposite polarity. I think freedom minded people should have children for sure, because just as we were playing catch up, um, we, we need to have freedom minded people people that understand what it truly means to be a human understand freedom and morality this is good so i think being in the mindset of oh i would never have children in this day and age it it's in a nihilist mindset it's playing to lose right so i get it um this control system in life can be tough can be hard but uh that will definitely make us strong as parents and our children strong as well. So make babies, people. <laughs> well, it's funny we say, we know, we need numbers. And then there's people who sure. say, well, hey, you know, I don't want to have a child. Well, it's like, that, there's your number right there. I mean, you're creating the future, literally. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's and it's powerful that that is your legacy. I mean, they, they literally are you, right? <laughs> They're taking an essence of you. Um, it, it, now think about know. that too. Sorry to interrupt. It's yeah. like uh, talk about a depopulation agenda, right? W w what works better than to to wear down an individual where they're hopeless and uh, they they just don't want to have children? I mean, this is epigenetics, right? right? So, yeah, man, it's deep. So, so yourself, right? You, you came through a lot of understanding and you had to break through your sort of unconsciousness. I think we all do to some extent because we live our lives and, you know, we want to live our lives and just live our lives, but we are influenced by so many different things. And especially in a consumerist age with so much information and so much material things, how did you break out of your unconsciousness and into the consciousness? And how did you break out of statism, this belief system that we tackle that is the belief in authority? You mentioned it earlier, but it's sort of an ideology, believing in man's opinion that it should rule over others through man-made law and through government. How did you break out of statism? How long were you a statist? Well, I, I'm personally very blessed because uh, I, I've never been a statist. And I actually come from a family that um, that are more anarchists, right? That understand moral principles. Um, I grew up on a ranch. My my dad. I come from a, a split family, but my my stepmom is has pretty much raised me and and had good relationship with with all my parents. Um, but they were very firm on doing the right thing, no matter what. Um, my dad, uh, you know, told me that it's okay to run from the cops. 
my grandpa did time in jail for not um for not giving up his his uh his money his fruits of his labor to the the slave masters of that day um and so they i come from a family where they see the wrong they understand the system is wrong wow. and uh that had a huge impact on me growing up um even going through public school i i could see it was like a big joke it didn't have validity to me um i was cherry picking on what i wanted to learn which didn't actually aid me in you know doing well in public school because i didn't like to be told what to do um so but my real my awareness gained um when i had my my child ultimately um i've always been into uh mysticism and got pretty deep into occultism and understanding uh, in context of understanding nature and how nature operated um it wasn't until um, a few years later that I actually started to apply this information to the world and get a good grasp of the current human condition. Hmm. Wow. So, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's amazing. Cause I, most of the people I talk to, it's like they had to, they have conflicts with their family. You know, they're not, they're not, uh, on the same page with a lot of things. I mean, myself included, I, I have a family I'm very close with, and I think that's what kept us going strong into where we shared our ideas with each other in time. But we didn't yeah. start from the very beginning like that, you know, from the very yeah. beginning, I, my family was very status because that was just the system we were into. But because we had that strong relationship over time, when I started learning new information, I related to them and they naturally grasped it onto it. So I think it's very interesting. You know, you share your perspective and mine and kind of looking at the differences. And it's amazing to see that you're you're speaking about this now publicly with people and, and sharing this, because I think that's that's a situation not a lot of people have, you know, like a, a family yeah. background like that. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm, I'm very blessed. And, and even though, um, you know, if you ask my parents, uh, do, you, do you consider yourself an anarchist and stuff like that? They would probably say no, but that's not those are just labels. Right. What's the principle and the action behind it? And those were that's what was instilled in me as as a young age. So as I got older, I recognized how I was raised and especially having a daughter this flipped the script and I had to change myself and the moral obligation to speak out as well. <laughs> Beautiful, so, man. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And if, if there's anything else you want to share, uh, cause we're almost reaching an hour now, but, uh, yeah. let me ask you a question. What made you grow out the beard? <laughs> it's been a while. I've seen you, you didn't have the beard for a while. I don't know if you ever yeah. talked about this uh, before in an interview. So I cool. I, I love it. Yeah, no. Um, my daughter, my daughter yeah. said, dad, I want to see what you look like if if it's you have a big beard and you look like Gandalf from <laughs> Lord of the Rings. And I said, well, let's do it. So I started growing the beard. My hair grows extremely fast. This is only like six months, six or seven months. And um, yeah, but she's like, it's time to cut, Dad. You, you, you can cut it down. It, it's getting a little crazy. So no, I think it's awesome, man. Are yeah, you sure no, you didn't watch my Lord of the Rings presentation? Is that is that <laughs> <out> it? <laughs> That's good. Yeah, man. Great presentation too. So hey, yeah, she, she likes to braid it. You know, she practices her braiding skills on there. And uh, yeah, you know what? What are dads for? Awesome. Yeah. Well, I definitely recommend people do check out your presentations because you have presentations and all sorts of things like focusing on certain topics. And I really like always how clear and concise you are. You know, I'm I'm all over the place sometimes because my mind goes like this because you know? <laughs> that's how I am. It's like, man, there's so much great information that we're always talking about. So I always have like this energy. I don't know what to do with it, but you're very clear and concise. And I appreciate you for doing that. It's always something I admire in your works. And uh, I definitely recommend people check out your presentations because you have really beautiful slides, beautiful way of presenting. I've always admired the professionalism and how you go out in the street, right? You want to share a little bit about how you do some street activism, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I met my partner, uh, John Rowland, about two years ago. We created Natural Freedom League, and that started. Uh, he was actually going out on the streets doing Moral Law Mondays just with some signs and a table and um uh, we met up with some other um, local people as well, and we started going out there and we kept doing this and uh, we, we've done it recently. And, you know, just um, just educating. We don't we don't consider it protesting. We we have been to some protests, but we set up on the side. We're there to educate on the causal factors, the moral principles 
And um, it's fantastic. I love it. I love making content and presentations for the internet to reach a wide body of, of minds. But I love going into the community, seeing eye to eye and uh, being there, you know, live in the flesh, because you never know what people are going to say. This this allows me to, you know, gain communication skills and uh, work on the Socratic method. And uh, yeah, I, I love it. So I highly recommend it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, man. thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us in this great event. And I'm glad to have you as a speaker and uh, everyone from the Natural Freedom League and everyone over there and all everything you guys do. Just thank you so much. And I hope a lot of people can take inspiration from that. Please check it out because it is great to see. I mean, what it is meeting people face to face. You see that energy, you get inspired, you want to do more. And that gives you more faith as to humanity. You realize that a lot of people are angry and a lot of people want to change things and they just don't know how to navigate it. They don't know what tools to use. And that's why, you know, talk about natural law, these principles, getting really clear about it and then meeting up with other people can do great wonders. So I, I appreciate you. Will for doing everything you're doing. And if anybody wants to see a lot more speakers like Will Keller, uh, go to nita.one slash summit, nita.one slash summit. This is the end of slavery summit. Uh, to check out more about Will Keller, please go to Will Keller. He's on all sorts of different platforms, right? And you also have naturalfreedomleague.com. That's naturalfreedomleague.com. And then also freedomundernaturallaw.com. So that's freedomundernaturallaw.com. Is there anything else you want to share uh, <laughs> links wise or that yeah that was it no th those are the two good links and uh you can get you can check out my presentations there and Corey, uh you're an inspiration i love the work that you're doing uh you're you're doing fantastic uh great work so i appreciate you very much and thanks for having me on the uh the summit thank you take care everybody <laughs>